Okay. <laughs> All right, here we are. Only six minutes over. Sorry about that. All this technology stuff is pretty wild, huh? Um, my name is Lara Monsonares, and I am inside of Tierra Wool's hand weaving workshop. Um, I'll try to not be muffled in this mask wearing world. Uh, we're in our new location in Chama, New Mexico. So hopefully you can kind of see a little bit of uh, the store back there and some of the yarns that we have. I'm gonna be weaving on a Rio Grande style loom here. Um, please, if you have any, any questions, please feel free to type them in and I'll see if I can get them answered. And meanwhile, um, I'm just gonna kind of start from the basics. I don't know, there might be some weavers out there uh, watching who already know this stuff, but maybe not. Maybe you're just curious uh, what is weaving, you know? Um, so here at Tierra Wools, we weave in the Rio Grande style. And so I'm just gonna show you guys some of the looms that we have. This is a Rio Grande style loom. You can kind of see it there. Um, and these looms were brought to the New World uh, by the uh, Spaniard conquistadores in the 1500s, uh, along with the churro sheep or churra sheep, uh, the wool that we still use today, us and also other cultures as well. Um, interesting thing about that, when the conquistadores arrived, they found that the uh, Pueblo Indians from this area uh, were already weaving, right? They were already weaving, but they were using cotton. Um, and so, and, and the loom that they were using um, was vertical. Uh, so there was already textile work going on in this area in New Mexico um, back in the 1500s when these when these guys showed up and but they they brought this uh, sort of standing room with treadles um, I'm not a historian but I'll tell you a little bit about what I know about that apparently it's the Chinese who first uh, sort of had the idea to use your feet to control the sheds, you know, to help you get through the weaving process. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, but this, this design sort of, um, as far as I know, came across the ocean with uh, the conquistadores and the, the people who, I mean, I don't know if they, those guys actually knew how to weave, but the people <laughs> who came with them, the settlers, um, there's a lot of history around that too. Some of it not so great, uh, but textiles, if you're a fan of textiles, you know that you look at the history of textiles in a place, you will learn a lot about the history of the people who are from a place or who, who lived there, um, a lot more than you might read in a regular textbook. Um, so anyway, I'll just kind of get going. Uh, so as you can see, these treadles that I showed you, they are an aid to the weaving process. So weaving, is mainly two sets of threads. This is what I tell people, vertical and horizontal. And then weaving encompasses just like so many things, so many ways that you can interlace the vertical and horizontal threads to create a fabric, you know, either soft to wear or something, you know, you could put on the floor that's stiffer. Um, and so the loom, there's all different types of looms. This loom in particular, um, the treadles aid in that process of interlacing the warp. This is the warp. This is the grid that we're working with. And the weft. The weft is like the color, I guess you call it. And in uh, Rio Grande style weaving, um, the here at Terra Wools, the the, uh, we make are weft-faced. And what that means 
is you can't see the warp. So the warp is like literally a grid that you're working on top of, and then the weft covers the warp as you go forward. Um, I wonder how much in detail I should go about about the difference. That's the main. That's the main thing. The way that you make that happen, the way that you make the weft um, cover the warp versus sort of being balanced. Uh, I like this. This is a different thing. This is a balanced weave where you can see the and the weft, the vertical and the horizontal evenly. You know, it's just one fabric and everything's sort of placed in there evenly. On these weft-based ones, the weft, the warp is set up so that it's spread out far enough in combination with the thickness of the weft colors here that the weft yarns, the colors, they can totally cover the, the warp. They can go, they can go over and under and over and under, like this, there's enough space between the threads here that the weft can totally cover it um, and pack down and create these cool blocks of color and designs um, using the weft sort of as a stabilizing force and not necessarily you don't see it unless at the end. Um, so, so the treadles basically open up, this is called a shed, this opening here, see, this is called a shed. When you're not stepping on either pedal, all of the threads are in line. When you step on one treadle, it lifts up half of the threads and pulls down the other half. This is a counterbalance loom. That's what that means, is that the tension rolls on this little piece of wood here, and the tension on the top and the bottom of the shed is even because it, this part just rolls. So you step on one treadle, and the threads open one way. You step on the other treadle, and they just open evenly the other way. And that's different from, say, some other European-style looms like uh, okay, I think I think I can talk to you now. We open the door, and it's the air is blowing in, and it's pretty empty in here. So it's different a little bit from the some other European style looms because uh, some other looms function in a way where the treadles, like a jack loom, the treadles um, are like when you open the shed only half the threads pop up and the other half just kind of stays on the bottom there and the, the tension doesn't change. So, so this particular type of loom for the Rio Grande style is, is very conducive to making really tightly packed, very heavy um, wool products like rugs. This is a rug that I'm making right here um, because, be, because you can, the looms are so big and then the, the way that the harnesses work here with the tension, these looms can withstand a very high tension in the warp. You can crank it up, you can just crank it up and crank it up. And so because of that, then you can make really thick, really heavy fabrics because see, it's just like this big, big machine that can handle some industrial strength. Um, so, um, if there's any questions, excited here since. Oh yeah, yeah. So the the Rio Grande style, I think I just uh, kind of talked about that a little bit. It's, it's weft faced, and it's it's a lot like actually the uh, Navajo style and the previous Pueblo style, um, except that the loom, is, those looms are vertical, and they use a lot of handwork. Uh, you know, they they sit at the loom and they use their hands to manipulate the sheds and weave the, 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 uh, the yarns through. On a Rio Grande style when we have this, all this stuff, right? To this heavy, heavy machinery that helps us um, get actually a similar, uh, similar feeling product, I guess, to, to a Navajo loom. Um, it's just a different way of weaving um, that, sort of was developed uh, using the, the yarns, you know, that we shared 
that we had, uh, as well as um, uh, it started with the Spaniards coming over and bringing them, but then they sort of became a very, very important part of the Navajo culture and weaving. Um, uh, yeah. So I'm just going to weave a little bit here. And I kind of chose some, some fall colors. Go. This is called a shuttle, shuttlecock, because it's it's, it's uh, faster to just say shuttle most of the time. Um, this is called a bobbin. I made this one out of a paper bag, but there are also some fancy wooden bobbins that you can wind the yarn onto. Uh, so this yarn died here at Terra Wools, um, and it comes actually from my parents' sheep which we're going to see again later this week uh, as we bring them down from the mountain. So I'm stepping on one of the treadles and it's helping open up the shed for that interlacing action. I laid a weft in the color. This is the beater. And on these big looms, the beater, most times you only really need one push, you know. Sometimes I'm teaching, and uh, and uh, folks who you know aren't used to the looms yet and stuff come in and they go like, you know get to get that packed in there and they do it twice and that's actually I always tell them on these looms that's not necessary you know it's they're you just need one because it's such a heavy thing um, and if you get in the habit of only doing it once. Every time, every action that you do takes time, takes a, a little bit amount of time. And I grew up here in Tierra Wolves in a production environment. I started working when I was about eight years old or so, and it was definitely uh, production focused, you know, efficiency, getting uh, weaving stuff onto the showroom floor. Um, and you know, not wasting time if we didn't have to. So little things like just knowing and trusting the loom that you just need one instead of two beats, that uh, that saves time in the end. In the overall, if you're doing five feet of this and you just think about all those little infinitesimal, you know, things that you do that take up a couple of extra seconds, um, you can they're being more efficient by just paying attention to those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, this is this is the loom. It's it kind of helps you helps you go faster without having to do everything, everything, every single thing by hand. I like Rio Grande style weaving on these big looms in particular because I have always been sort of an athlete and a very active in my body type of person. And so I really like the physicality. I really like these big looms and how I'm using my, my feet and my balance and my arms and my shoulders and my fingers and my brain. And like, it's a kind of a full body thing. So that's kind of what I like about this particular style of, of weaving. Um, any other questions? How are you keeping your edges smooth? Okay. All right, that brings us to Probably the most asked question that I have ever received as a weaver in this showroom environment when folks, customers come through and they, and as a kid and in high school and, you know, I was, I was a worker, but I was also sort of part of the, uh, the display in a way, uh, because we're weaving here where, where customers can see. And so the most asked question, apart from how long does it take you to make one, uh, was why why are you putting that? Why are you putting the yarn up in the middle like that? You see why I did that? And that has a lot to do with keeping the edges smooth. Okay. Um, you may already be familiar with this, but basically the reason that we put an arc, that's called an arc every time. Some weavers in, in other styles of looms, they, they do a full like 
they don't do an arc. Some do it, they pull it up from here, you know, but we do an arc here in this style. And the arc is because, as I said earlier, the weaving, uh, the act of weaving is basically these two vertical and horizontal interlacing, right? So the vertical is set. The warp vertical that's in front of me, that's set. That's intention, that's not really gonna change. So it's the warp thread is the one that has to have a little give, you know, to be able to go have enough slack to go over and under and over and under this whole grid. Um, so when we, when I have one shed open and I put the yarn through, it looks like, oh, okay, you know, there's plenty of slack. The yarn's fine. It's just kind of hanging out there. Uh, it's, 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 you know, why would I have to, why can't I just do that? Why can't I just put it across? It looks fine. Well, the thing is, if you just put it across like that and then you change sheds, you know, then you close it all and that, and everything sort of falls back into place. And suddenly you have these two, um, the, the things that were separate now are pushing on in every single one of these little spaces between. It's now tugging on this string in. So the arc gives slack so that when you change and the warp pulls the weft sort of into line with itself, then there's enough slack that when you beat it down, it all kind of goes into place there. And that's, that's a big part, I think I'm going to change colors now, that's a really big part of the edges. There are other parts, but that's sort of the, the, the main part of getting good edges, is having a consistent and good arc. And a general rule of thumb here is, so let me get a darker color, maybe a brown. Um, rule of thumb is, the arc should be more or less about, the height of the arc should be more or less about 25% of the width of the weaving, pretty much. So some people cut out a guide, you know, made out of cardboard, they measure so you can kind of see. I, I learn to do it kind of by feel and by my arm. Sometimes if I'm not sure, if I'm starting out on a new width that I've not done before, then I kind of measure, okay, this is halfway, Half of that, 25. Okay, that's about up to here on my hand. So then now I kind of have an idea when I do the arc. Okay, it should be about that high. And so that kind of, I use my body a lot in this part of it. So the height of the arc uh, is one thing. And then the other thing is paying attention to the actual edge itself. Okay, so on the, these Rio Grande style limbs with very high tension, um, which I, I love, it's a little too fat. It's another thing, when you wind your bobbins, try not to make, make them too fat because then they won't fit in the shell. It's always a thing. Um, is on the edges, so on a, on a high tension like this, we don't want our edges to be too loose and loopy. We don't want the weft to be hanging off the edge. Um, but we want it to be, you know, we want it to be uniform and snug and tight and, and straight. Okay. The, the overall straightness has a lot to do with the arc. Um, the, the, the loopiness versus like too tight individual threads. That's something that you kind of have to eye and work with. But on this style, I like to tell students that when you're doing the arc, so I grab the shuttle. This is sort of my method, and it's sort of the like speed weaver method in a way, and a way to control things with my body without having to put pass the shuttle through and put it down and then you know like figure it out and then change sheds and then get the shuttle again, which is what one does when you're learning, and that's that's fine. Um, but over time, you know, you develop your own ways of doing it. So so I have the shuttle in one hand. I put my finger on the bobbin so that I can control how much it unravels or doesn't. I can have a little bit of a break here. This is my break. 
And so I use that when I, okay, let me just, oh yeah, because as you can see, okay, so I start here. <laughs> I have my break on, okay, I use this hand to pull out some slack, okay, and that that just helps everything so that if you sometimes if you don't if you don't pull out a little slack first then as you're going through sometimes the bottom gets kind of stuck and it's like yeah you know as you're like trying to push it through the shed and it's like bleh, bleh, you know and then you end up getting your edge too tight because you're like fighting with the yarn here so i have my hand on the brake i pull out some slack and then i put my shuttle through just a little flick of the wrist, just like that. As soon as I finish pulling out the slack, already my hand is going over here to catch the shuttle. Okay, I catch the shuttle hand, I might put the brake on. Okay, this hand, after throwing the shuttle, right away it's going to make the, the arc. Okay, sometimes you, you're not supposed to we're taught like not to mess with the edge too much to do it all from here. Sometimes it's way up here. I have to like put it down. So, okay. Hand on the brake, pull it through. I'm doing the arc. And now here I use this, my hands on the brake here and this is on the arc. So I'm feeling with the, this tension here, you can feel the tension that you're pulling here with this hand. You can feel it here at the arc. And you can adjust both of these things together in tandem, you know, to get the correct tension. And as I'm doing this with these hands, then I'm also, my eyes are looking at that edge. Okay, so I'm over here working the tension with these ones. My eyes are looking at this edge. And I tell folks that uh, the right tension to have at the edge there, you don't want the yarn to be hanging off the edge. You also don't want it to be like really pulling in like that. I tell them you, you should have it so that it's like they're kissing. There's a little bit of movement, you know, so so the edge is is just is just taut enough that it's just barely kind of moving this ed, the, the end thread of the warp. So it's not pulling it in, it's not letting it loose, but it's just letting it like, hey, here I am, you know, like here's that makes any sense. And I don't know if you can see it that well in the live because it's kind of a, let's see, it's kind of a close up type of thing. Let's see if I can get this right here without breaking my computer. So, okay, very carefully. So you can kind of see the edge here, right? You don't want it to be hanging off like that. You also don't want it to be like that. See how it's just like strangling it there. You want it to have a healthy relationship <laughs> where they're both respecting each other, where the weft and the warp thread are both respecting each other and they're both like saying hello. And I tell people like they're, they're kissing. Um, so you're using your other hands to kind of, see, it's just kind of moving it right there. Bring it in just a little, you know, chain sheds. And I'm going to move my computer because, and then beat. So that's generally, that's generally sort of the edges lesson in general that I usually give is just to use your whole body, use this brick. Use your index finger as a break. That's a big one for me. If I don't have it there and it's just like it's chaos and then, you know, the yarn is just going wherever and it's rolling out, and it's, but it, you know, you have the control here with your break and, uh, and your other arm. So I hope that answered your question about the edges. And, and it's a dance too, you know, as you keep going throughout the whole thing, it's a constant. It's you're constantly adjusting, right? You're constantly keeping an eye, you're always checking, saying like, am I drawing in or not? Ooh, I am, what do I have to do to adjust? I adjust the arc, I adjust things. So it's sort of a constant dance all the way through and it's uh, dangerous to kind of like zone out and like not pay attention to that because you'll, you'll be sorry um, after you finish. Uh, 
I'm giving you is can you talk about the temple? Oh, okay. It was an individual with Venus at the edge. Oh, okay, cool. I'm glad it helped. Okay, great. I'm glad you guys are enjoying this. Um, these are all little things that I kind of picked up, you know, from my parents as we, uh, as I learned to weave as a kid. Um, none of this came from a text. Some of it came from a textbook, I guess, uh, ultimately, but I learned sort of in my body. The temple. Okay. Yeah. That's another question people ask sometimes is, um, what is this thing, right? This, uh, this is called a temple, um, or a, we call it a stretcher bar as well. And this is an adjustable little, it, it's a guide. It's a guide that we use to help, uh, to help keep the edges straight. So I guess, yeah, it's part of that last question as well. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like to rely too much on it. It is definitely a very useful guide. I like to, to really rely on my body and, and feeling the loom and feeling the weaving, you know, um, because I, I, I don't know, it's just more fun for me, I guess. And also that if, if you rely too, I feel like if you rely too much on the temple, then, then you're just like not really getting the point of making the, the edges straight. But the temple is a very good guide. And, and it's because we have up here, right, on the, on the beater, we can see the width because that's, that's where the warp comes through. But as it comes down, like our vision, you know, we, we, it's, it can be easy to, we're not right in front of the edges. We're like over here, like we're like at an angle. So, so it, sometimes you can like be drawing in and not realize it a lot of times. Everybody does it. I do it. <laughs> you're drawing in and you don't realize it because you're not you're not seeing vertical right here. So the temple is actually a really good guide when you adjust it to the width using these little holes here. You can make it smaller or larger. You adjust it to the width at the reed. This is called the reed. This is the beater. This thing that's in in the beater. This little cone looking thing. This is the reed. So if you measure at the reed and have the edge of the uh, uh, warp come to the, the little edge right before the little needle things right here. So not that outer edge, but in here. Um, you measure it there and you set, make your settings and now you have a guide that's closer to the actual weaving. So you can monitor, like you can be able to see if you, put your temple on and it like stretches the weaving leg way out. You're like, whoa, okay. That means that I was drawing it and that's not good. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a visual, sort of a visual guide. It's not, it won't correct any boo-boos that you make. It'll help you get back on track if you did make a boo-boo, but this thing won't correct it. Like it's the weaver. The weaver is the one that will, you are the one that will correct it. So this is, this is a guide. Um, and that's called a temple or a stretcher bar. Um, okay, so no other comments at the moment. So I'm going to weave a little bit more. Um, so another thing, I guess, I, I don't know too much of the history of the actual designs of the real garment style, but um, I grew up in this... Uh, environment, all those kinds of things, and also a little bit of the, of the history of the area in the southwest and, and textiles, there was a lot of trading of textiles um, with Mexico uh, down in Saltillo, and actually just last night I was kind of looking over this cool book, um, Rio Grande Textiles, this talks more about the, the designs and stuff. Um, I, so you should definitely, if you're, if you could find this book, it's by Nora Fisher, Rio Grande Textiles, compiled and edited by Nora Fisher. And there's some history parts in the beginning here. And I thought it was interesting um, that in the setting, it talks about actually back in the day, it says, uh, 
One of the most important 18th century trade fairs was at Saltillo in Mexico. And you'll see sometimes in the Rio Grande style weaving something called the Saltillo Star. So you'll see some of the design elements, you know, that crossed over from, from Mexico and that were shared also with the, the Pueblo peoples and the Navajo peoples and then the settlers that were here um, with the, the um, that came from New Spain and stuff. So, so there's, there's some crossover. But so it says one of the most important 18th century trade fairs was at Saltillo in Mexico. Each September, textiles from Europe and Asia, as well as Mexi from Mexico, were offered in trade to New Mexican and Texan buyers. And then it says, and this is cool because the Taos Wool Festival, obviously, this is for the Taos Wool Festival going on. Each autumn, the Taos Fair in northern New Mexico attracted southern buyers from Chihuahua and Saltillo. The Chihuahua Fair was held in July and the fair at San Juan de los Lagos in December. So, so there was a lot of trade. There was a lot of trade. The, the, the Taos, um, Taos was, uh, you know, one of the hubs of, or, you know, there was a, a, a fair there where people would cross and, and uh, share ideas and share designs. And, you know, with New Mexico, Northern New Mexico was, you know, fairly isolated. But that doesn't mean that that we we're totally isolated. You know, there was influence from other places for sure. Um, I just want to make sure you loved it. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. And there's, you know, we've been here. Tierra Rules, not here. This is our new location. But Tierra Rules has been open since I think 1983. A few months before I was born. Just gave away my age. Um, and and, uh, but Tirobo started, you know, based on a lot of knowledge that was already in the area and in Northern New Mexico. And you mentioned Lisa Trujillo and, and um, Irwin and Chimayo and the Ortega weavers. You know, there was a very rich, rich history um, of weaving in, in Northern New Mexico. And um, so Tirobo is, is, is uh, one interesting thing to note is, is, or to talk about, I think, is the teachers who came through. Um, I guess the Basan or Baisan, um, I'm sure the Trujillos would know a lot more about this because it was sort of in their area, uh, came through. And there was sort of periods of, uh, there were things were flourishing and then periods of where things, you know, were dying out. And then, Teachers, teachers would come like to, to northern New Mexico and um, and either teach people again or there was a lot of people that still had and still have looms in their homes and it was just it went from being of like a trade a big widespread trade thing in the 1700s I think when the industrial revolution and everything and, and the railroad changed things and so people could get get stuff a lot cheaper from different, you know, areas. And so, so the actual weaving trading with um, internationally and kind of died down and it became things, something that people did at home for their own, for their own use. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Feel good on the style room. Um, yeah. There's more that I could that I could talk about. Um, if anyone has any other questions, oh, I can give you guys a tip. Actually, this is kind of an interesting tip um, that I tell my students sometimes. Okay, how to break a super thick, super thick uh, yarn. Um, so sometimes I encounter students, and maybe you've had this as well. Um, where we have these really thick rug yarns and you're struggling to like, well, how do I break it without, it, but with leaving a uh, little end like that so that when you're changing colors, you can splice it, you can splice it in. Whereas if you use scissors, it creates a really blunt edge, which then it has a tendency to poke out of your weaving later on. And then you have to go back and mend it. And it just adds to the time and the fuss of doing the weaving. Um, so in order to get a splice, 
like that, there's with a really thick yarn, a couple ways. First, grab the yarn with both fingers and kind of separate it. Make a little opening there between it. Hook in your fingers. And then it kind of comes apart, see? So that's one way to create a nice um, edge like that. Another way, my faster way, as a teenager and stuff, it was just like weave, 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 you know, weave, weave, and I didn't have much, I didn't have much time to just kind of like do all the ends like that. So one uh, tip that I give people is to, if you want to break something, grab the yarn, kind of wrap it around a couple of fingers here, a couple of fingers there. And then when you pull it, use your shoulders. Don't just use your wrists, right? You'll be there all day and you might hurt yourself. Wrap it here, wrap it here. Put your elbows out. And pull from back here. So you're using, right? You're using your whole body. Um, so that's something that I just kind of started to do in high school because it was just faster. And I didn't realize that I even did that until a student said, how are you breaking that yarn? And I was like, well, hmm, that's a good, a good question. Then I thought, oh, okay, yeah, I'm using my whole body, not just my fingers and my wrists. And that's, and that's I think for me, and at least for me personally, the Rio Grande style of weaving for me is all about that, all about using your whole body Feeling the feeling the the weaving with 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 your body, you know, using the balance, using your whole body to break the thread, to you know, do, do these different things. So that's that's kind of a cool tip, and um, I think we're coming coming close to the time here. I can just I can go on until I can go till two, I guess. So we have about fifteen more minutes. Um, if anyone has any more questions, um, this is a metric. Oh, okay. On a long piece, how do you keep track of your vertical pattern so it ends up symmetrical? Um, well, the design elements of weaving are pretty, can be pretty individual to each weaver, you know, each method um, that someone has. I do sometimes do symmetrical. I sometimes do just kind of like, I'm just going to do this. It's just, you know, I try to kind of keep diff, uh, if I'm not, if I'm going to do something that is not exactly mirroring itself, but I want to keep, you know, I don't want to use up all of my orange in the first half and then not have anything for the second half. So visually, um, one thing that I do, if I'm going to do something where I don't have it planned out and I'm just kind of going with the colors, but I have a certain amount of each color, when I wanted the bobbins, I separated all, all of the colors into half, you know, I put half the bobbins here, half the bobbins is like first half of the weaving, second half of the weaving, so that it doesn't have to be exactly the same mirroring, okay, if you don't want to, but at least you'll know that the colors will be balanced throughout and you won't run out of one. So that's one tip for that type, but if I am doing a symmetrical weaving, if I have already planned it out, a graph paper or something like that, then you know, that's one way. Um, another way is sometimes I build the weaving and I decide it's gonna be symmetrical, but I'm building it and I have a little notepad here. Actually, there's somebody else's notes here. Yeah, have a little notepad here or somewhere with a pen. And then when I, you know, I weave however much yellow and then I write down, you know, two inches of yellow or whatever name I've given that color. And I just keep track. And then once I get to the middle and I'm like, all right, then I just follow the pattern that was from the beginning one and flip it around. So that's, that's, how, that's how I do it. Um, other weavers may have other ways of working. And that's kind of the cool thing about weaving is that it's so individual. Um, one thing that I didn't realize uh, when I was growing up and when I was weaving, I, I grew up in, in Tierra Wolves and um, 
it was just sort of a given that all of the weavers designed their own pieces. You know, I just grew up with that. I thought, well, that's, that's just how it is. Um, and it wasn't until later when I was older and I, I read this book called, um, I think it's called Three Weavers and it's about uh, Rachel Brown who was one of the main um, folks who came and helped us get started with tarot rules and kind of organized classes for, for folks who hadn't woven before or maybe had ancestral knowledge that hadn't quite gotten passed down and they sort of had it in their body and their blood but they needed sort of like, um, I don't know, just some inspiration, maybe they start going again. So this book has, is about her and two other women from New Mexico who were uh, doing weaving ventures and, and um, and they talked about some other weaving workshops in, I think it was in Trampas. I may be wrong. I'll have to look at the book again in Las Trampas, uh, or either Las Trampas or Truchas. And they talked about starting this weaving workshop and that, oh, you know, we have the design and we give the design to the weavers. And we, like, they had a different person, like the designer, and the weavers were just like doing somebody else's design, you know, production production um so that kind of blew me away because because i i hadn't really realized that that was apparently sort of the more of the norm at least in that i don't know about in northern new mexico but in the, in the places that in some part of the weaving world right that's more of the norm is you have a designer that makes the design and then they pass it along to the workshop and the weavers just kind of like follow the design. Um, uh, so, so when Rachel Brown came uh, to Tierra Wools and did weaving and, classes and, and she, um, she also did design classes and color classes and, uh, you know, there was more of a like, no, you don't need someone else to, you know, everyone is, is, is unique. Every, you can make your own design, you can make your own design and weave it and somebody's gonna like it and, and buy it and sell it. You don't need necessarily to have, not, not to knock college degrees. I have a college degree, I have a master's degree in design and that's cool. Um, but for here at, at Tierra Bulls for getting going, it was just, I think, kind of a nice thing to come in and, uh, and just let people know, like, you know, we're not gonna run it that way. That is one way to do things. But in this, we want you to do your own designs and, and you know, create your own artistry and find your own color space and, and, you know, create something that you're really proud of. And it's not necessarily just a job um, waiting for someone else. Um, so that's some interesting history that I didn't realize because I was that um, and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, that sounds incredibly boring. Because <laughs> I just loved growing up and being, being like, when it was time to design a weaving, I'd go into the showroom, I'd look at the other weaver's pieces, and I would say, I would say, uh, you know, it was just, it was just cool. Everyone was just so unique. Everyone they would put together color combinations that I would never have thought of and like make them work. Um, and everybody kind of had their signature. There was something about a certain weaving, you know, that you could look at it and say, oh, I think, I think, yeah, that must be one of Joanna's or whatever, you know, and, and it was. Um, so everybody had their own personal flair and uh, cool breaking the yarn, dividing the bobbins. Yeah. So anyway, that's just, I'm kind of, I guess that's weaving. I'm talking about weaving still. Different ways of thinking about it. One other thing here at Terra Wools that I thought was the norm because I grew up here and I, then I realized when I went to California College of the Arts and I was teaching weaving there for a little little while as a, I was a, a teaching assistant for a while. And um, in, that, in that atmosphere, it was everybody was doing a single piece, right? a single weaving. And I have never, I have never envisioned weaving that way because we're a production environment. So when we warp the looms, these looms, they're, they're kind of massive. So let me show you. 
when we warp the looms, you know, we we got like a 30 yard warp or, you know, warp. Can you see that huge beam? Get a warp that uh, that can, will last, that will create several weavings without having to cut off and rewind the warp and everything. Um, so, so that's how I, what I was accustomed to, like production environment, efficiency, creating several weavings at once and then cutting off and pressing. And so it was, it kind of blew my mind a little bit when I went to a more like art school environment and you're just doing one piece and putting a lot of time and effort into each um, your, your warp and dyeing your warp and like really creating a very unique one of a kind piece. Um, so that was a really interesting experience for me because I hadn't done that before. Um, now that I'm looking at the, we're looking at the looms, uh, let's talk a little bit. There's a little bit about this on the Tierra Wolves website um, where we talk about the looms that we have here specifically. So this, I mentioned that this design was sort of brought over, you see the, there we go, with, uh, for the Spaniards. But these particular looms that we have here, uh, uh, all of these looms are handmade. And that's another thing about Rio Grande style weaving in general, I think that you'll find is that handmade looms, handmade looms, looms that were made by people in their homes um, and not so much things that you can buy from Glimacra, you know, um, mass produce things. It's like, you want a real Grande style loom, you kind of got to build one. <laughs> um, Rachel Brown was selling them for a while, but that um, sh uh, there are only a few of those left, I guess. So when Tierra Wool started, uh, we had, you know, they had a bunch of people that were on board to like, let's do this, let's do this thing. But they didn't have looms. There was like a couple of looms that had been in someone's house uh, and, um, but there were a bunch of weavers and, you know, we really wanted to start a production workshop. And so, uh, so I think it was Cruz Aguilar, um, first made the first looms out of pine, I believe wood for the workshop, but then they found that those ones didn't last. Uh, they were fine for, um, sometimes, but for the level of production here at Tierra Wolves, uh, they were um, soft, very soft pine, you know, so they didn't hold up quite as well. So then at some point um, we got a couple of Rachel Brown looms. I think we still have one in the other room. Uh, and then we needed more looms and bigger looms and also looms. So Another thing about Rio Grande style weaving um, was that traditionally in the homes, and this is sort of based on census figures and other stories and family histories as well, it was the it was the men who did the weaving part. The women would like card the wool, wind the bobbins, you know, do the kind of the grunt work, <laughs> I guess you could say. And then the men would, you know, work on the machine and get up on this big loom. I think part of that may have been just because these things were massive, you know, and especially back in the day, you're kind of doing your own. There was kind of rudimentary, kind of like not that easy to work. Um, so we wanted to do big pieces here at Tierra Wools and the majority of the people that were interested in doing it uh, were, were women. And so um, at some point, uh, a man named Hans Leitner was contracted to build some Rio Grande style looms. So he came into the shop and he looked at the looms and he studied them for a while. And he actually designed his own Rio Grande style loom, which are these ones. The one I'm weaving on was not done by him but we have a few other ones. And you, when you come into the shop, you can tell the Hans Leitner looms because they sort of have this nice smooth edges on the beams here. And then he also added this cross here for stability. So they, these can like be really super high tension and really make really heavy stuff. You kind of see that there. He added those, these beams here. 
these cross X beams to kind of stabilize everything. Um, and also they're big, but they're not quite as tall. They're a little bit easier for someone who maybe isn't quite as tall to, to weave, you know? Um, yeah, so the, you know, the distance between the beam and the beater is maybe not quite as much. They're a little bit more, just a little more squat. It's this, the beam is real smooth here. They're just very nice. They're very friendly, very friendly looms and very stable and made out of a hardwood. I'm not sure what kind of wood it is, but they're made out of a very hard wood. And then the, the um, ratchets and things, they're big, heavy metal, but they're designed to, to be, you know, they can turn nicely and easily and not just be a big pain in the rear end. <laughs> so that's a little bit about the looms. And we have several of the Hans Leitner looms here at Terrell's um, media classes. Um, we close during the winter time, but in the spring, summer and fall, there's um, weaving class every week uh, available. And uh, you can sign up for those on the website, handweavers.com. And uh, there's beginning weaving, there's, um, which is basically what I've showed you here. Uh, and, and the beginning weaving includes warping the loom. So we do, you do a day of warping the loom. So that's, that's, that's fun. That's always fun. <laughs> um, beginning weaving and then uh, tapestry weaving and then advanced tapestry weaving. Um, so those are sort of the three weaving classes that we offer. And they're a week long each, from Monday through Friday from I think nine or 9.30 in the morning till about 4 p.m. Um, and they're, they're a lot of fun. Uh, it's a lot of fun to teach them when I get the chance as well. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this, we also do individual, if you already are a weaver and you just need a refresher, you don't wanna take the whole weaving class. Uh, you just wanna have a couple of days with an instructor, you know, get some tips, kind of get back into it or, you know, learn some extra tapestry techniques or something like that. Um, we also can do that. Um, and that's also on the website. You don't have, have to take a whole class if you already are at a certain level. And then we also, uh, when we're open, um, spring, summer, and fall, uh, you can come in and, and use the loom for a fee. Like there's a daily fee. I think the actual fee is listed on the website. So you can come, if you don't have one of these and you wanna work on one of these, you're a weaver, you can come schedule a few days to, to make a piece on one of these cool, pretty unique um, Rio Grande style looms. Like, I love the, I love this one. I'm tall, I'm taller. So this is one of the tallest looms. And so I like this one cause I'm tall and it fits me this taller one, but like the lower kind of smoother Hans Leitner looms um, are very, very popular as well. And then we have a couple of like smaller looms as well. If you just want to do a little, uh, you know, table runner or something like that. Uh, okay. Um, all right. We're right at 2 PM and I think I'm going to go ahead and sign out. Did anyone have any final questions before I go? Um, I hope that this was informative and helpful, maybe a little bit of history. And there's there's more history, of course. I'll show you a couple of books. This is a good book if you can find it. This is a great book. It talks about the history and it just has these great historical designs and stuff. But you're welcome, you're welcome. Um, specific to Rio Grande style. Um, so this is a really cool book. Another another good book. This is goes more in depth. This is like a lot of very in depth history. Um, is this one Chimayo weaving? And then this one you'll probably see um, more of our, our neighbors in uh, in Chimayo. You know, I think we're in here too. Like maybe on a page or two. Ah, there's one of those old 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 style 
Rio Grande to see the guys down there and it's kind of rough, kind of rudimentary and kind of like um, probably a little harder to manage. You're welcome. You're welcome. And one final book. This one can be hard to find, but this is a treasure. Wool's um, classes are based on the this Rachel Brown's. She she helped uh, design our classes, and it's, it's a lot of it is from this book. And it's great, really. All these drawings done by Rachel Brown. It's just amazing. It just blows my mind. Just great. Oh my gosh. If you can find it, this is also a great one to get. All right, I'm gonna sign out. Thank you once again, and I hope you're enjoying the Taos Wool Festival. Thank you to the Taos Wool Festival for this opportunity. And um, yeah, um, come visit us when you can. We're open right now, and um, we will be through the fall, and then hopefully next year, you know, things will get moving and we'll be able to see you in person. All right. Buenas tardes a todos, and um, we'll see you later. Bye.